the prince that was promised? Of the Song of Ice and Fire? <laughs> About Egon the Conqueror? Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full House of the Dragon Season 2, Episode 3 video. We finally started to see the actual Dance of the Dragons war beginning with both sides making a couple of key moves. There were a ton of book references, so we'll break it all down. Everybody grab your swords, hop your dragons. It is time to burn the realm to the ground. If you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. The episode was titled The Burning Mill. It's a reference to the battle at Burning Mill that they opened the episode with. But there are a couple intro scene changes too. They added a scene of baby Jaehaerys during his funeral procession. Remember with his head sewed on. Who else thought that all the jostling was going to cause his head to fall off of his body and just roll through the streets? That would have been a very Game of Thrones type of moment. Then they had a scene of Aegon having all the rat catchers hung with their blood pouring towards the Iron Throne. Also metaphor for the coming Dance of the Dragons, the fact that blood will flow through the street. Like it's going to be a lot of collateral damage. A lot of people are going to die. I think the reason why they didn't change the intro in last week's episode, like updating it episode to episode, is because they wanted to show baby Jaehaerys lying this way and it hadn't happened in the episode yet and they didn't want to give that away. But I think now, just like the original series and during season one, they'll update the intro episode to episode, just adding scenes to the tapestry, like someone is weaving the tapestry. The actual opening scene, like I said, is the battle at Burning Mill. They're calling this person Davos Blackwood. Reminds you of Davos from the original Game of Thrones series. This one, just a little more unhinged, though. Basically showing you how the actual battle at Burning Mill, the larger battle, began between their houses with this smaller force here. Then they transition to showing him dead after the larger battle of the actual mill on fire in the background with the Bracken sword sticking out of him. The Blackwoods had declared for Rhaenyra and the Brackens had declared for Aegon II. So the Blackwoods early on started invading Bracken Islands in the Riverlands. The Brackens then retaliated by sending their troops into Blackwood territory where the Blackwoods catch them here at the place that's called the Burning Mill. Within the world of Game of Thrones, they're kind of like the Hatfields and the McCoys, two neighboring houses that have had one of the longest running family feuds in the history of Westeros. It goes all the way back to the Age of Heroes before the wall was constructed, before the first long night. That's how long their families have been at war with each other. It's been going on so long that no one in present day, particularly these two groups here, can remember why they started fighting in the first place, what caused the feud just in general. The Blackwoods and the Brackens have feuded for centuries. This is nothing more. It's meant to echo Rainey's statement to Rhaenyra earlier in the episode about how the same thing will happen during the Dance of the Dragons between the Blacks and the Greens. Soon the fighting will get so bad, everyone will hate each other so much, there'll be so much collateral damage, that no one will remember what actually started the war in the first place. Technically, though, she was wrong because the Maesters recorded everything that happened, all the different battles and engagements, in pretty good detail. But as George R. R. Martin and the showrunner tell it, the show is meant to be the truer version of events, like the first-person version of events. The Fire and Blood book that recorded all this history is a third-party account that's only meant to be partially reliable. But when it details all the different engagements, the actual battles and the Dance of the Dragons, it is correct in the actual battles itself. So the cause of the war was pretty well known. There are a lot of people that were wondering if this was meant to be Ben Jacot Blackwood, a.k.a. Bloody Ben. There's a lot of talk about him online the last week. In the books, he was the young son of Samwell Blackwood, the Lord of House Blackwood, when the Dance of the Dragons begins. In the books, when the actual Battle of Burning Mill went down, Ben was only about 11 years old. His father is killed during the battle, and he becomes Lord at the age of 11. He winds up fighting in a bunch of battles later on during the Dance of the Dragons and after, lives a very long life, becomes named Bloody Ben eventually. This battle between the Blackwoods and the Brackens is also meant to be a callback to their battle during Season 1, Episode 4 at Rhaenyra's courtship meeting where the Blackwood boy wound up killing the Bracken boy that was making fun of him. Just another example of their continuing feud. Then we get the funeral of the Cargill twins, R.I.P., press F to pay respects. Jace calling for revenge seems like he's starting to think more like Damon calling for war. Later in the episode, he's also getting very impatient with Rhaenyra too, like he wants to hop on his dragon and start fighting people too. Rhaenys also correctly clocks that Otto Hightower would have prevented this kind of bloodshed. In Hotter Blood, she references just assuming something like what we saw go down in the previous episode actually happened, but she doesn't actually know that Otto Hightower was fired as Hand of the King. She's just assuming that the other people in the small council, like the crazier people, are prevailing. When she suggests that Rhaenyra might be able to reason with Allison, the two of them come up with a more peaceful solution to the war, that sets up the end of the episode too, which a couple of big payoffs from season one. 
when she says there's no war as bad as a war between kin or hated as a war between kin and bloody as one with dragons, part of the idea is that the worst thing you can do in the eyes of the faith of the seven of those gods is kin slaying. Makes you remember the battle of the Cargill twins with twins slaying each other. Basically the worst possible thing you can do. Also a metaphor for the actual Dance of the Dragons because it's a civil war within the Targaryen family. And hyping up the dragon battles, like once the dragons do actually start fighting in pitch battle and against each other, it will just be all out carnage. Then we get Kristen Cole's first day as Hand of the King. Notice he's moved into Otto Hightower's old chambers, which Allison was just in talking to him with since he's left and gone to Highgarden. We'll see Otto Hightower again this season though. Notice him clocking the King's Guard, seem kind of lax sitting around. Their Aegon's two friends from before likely got their positions because of his favor. Also, you see this happening later in the episode too, where basically nobody's following the rules now that Aegon's in charge. Even Kristen Cole, worst Hand of the King to ever become Hand of the King, Sir Trashbag, thinks that these people are douchebags. So if a douchebag thinks you're a douchebag, that means you're probably a giga douche. This will definitely not end well for Aegon. Notice Alicent, the rest of the small council, get on Kristen Cole's case for the terrible plan getting Arik Cargill killed, even though they don't really care as much about Eric Cargill. They just bemoan the plan as being absolutely terrible. Like, how could you do something as stupid as that? Aemon then brings up the battle between the Blackwoods and the Brackens, the battle at Burning Mill. He thinks it's a call for open war, but notice how most of the small council, like everybody who's not Aegon, Kristen Cole, and Aemond, thinks they should just blame it on the ancient enmity between House Bracken and House Blackwood. Like, it's no big deal. It's not a war. It's just two houses looking for an excuse to fight each other. Because they correctly do not want an actual war with the Blacks. Like, it'll only end badly for both sides. They mention Grover Tully, current Lord of River Run. We'll see more of River Run soon. George R. Martin named him after Grover from Sesame Street. There's a bunch of characters that George R. Martin named after Sesame Street characters. Like there's a Kermit Tully and Elmo Tully that's alive during this part of the timeline. They mention Ormond Hightower is bringing the Hightower army from Old Town, but it'll take a while to get here. He's the current Lord of House Hightower. He's Otto Hightower's older brother. And they mention Daron Targaryen and his dragon Tessarion again, making it sound like he's right around the corner, like he'll be ready in a couple months. That's probably a joke from the showrunners, like winking behind the camera, like, ah, you've been asking for Daron. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring him to the show in a couple months, which basically means next season, probably. Tylan Lannister also references his twin brother Jason is bringing the Lannister army soon, but it's just taking time, like it's taking them a while to actually marshal all their different forces that they have available to them right now. Kristen Cole wants to march on Harrenhal and take the Riverlands, basically the same idea that Damon just had. He wants to ignore Allison's advice, as does everyone else it seems like. Part of the idea with Allison is that you see this later in the episode too when she's talking to Rhaenyra and she learns the truth about Aegon's prophecy, that she was wrong in thinking that he was speaking about Aegon II. Basically nobody on the small council wants to listen to her, like they pretend like she's not there almost. So even if she learned the secret of life and started shouting it to the small council here, nobody would listen to her. They also want to try and stop Aegon from taking Sunfire into battle with Kristen Cole's smaller force, just mostly thinking he can't handle it, but they try to pass it off as him just being too important, like, oh, we can't lose you, you're too important, you gotta stay here. In reality, most people think that he's pretty feckless and it will only end badly, like, you are not built for this kind of dragon battle. Notice Aegon is playing with Aegon the Conqueror's Valyrian Dagger with the prophecy of A Song of Ice and Fire that's written on it, which they reference at the end of the episode too, when Rhaenyra is talking about the true prophecy to Alicent, telling her the truth of the matter. You have to remember that Aegon didn't get the prophecy from Viserys because he never intended, actually intended for him to become king, so we never passed that on to him. Back on Dragonstone, Maseria is rewarded by Rhaenyra, naming her as the new Mistress of Whispers on the Black Council, putting her skills to use. It's basically her plan at this point, her contacts that help Rhaenyra sneak into King's Landing to meet with Alicent later in the episode. Notice she also references the plight of the small folk, like she's thinking about that. That'll be important for later. The showrunner said just in general that this season and future seasons, as well as the Duncan Egg show, which is going to be much later in the timeline, will all start showing more the perspective of the small folk. Whereas during season one, you're mostly just seeing the people at the highest levels of the Targaryen family. There was that brief moment during season one where Damon snuck young Rhaenyra out to Flea Bottom and was telling her to pay attention to the small folk. Like, you need to look around. These are your subjects. At the time, she didn't think that it was that big a deal. Like, who cares what the small folk think? 
That was basically meant to be foreshadowing for events later in the series. Part of the idea is that there are way more of the small folk than there are of highborn people. So even though you think they might not be that big of a deal, if they were to actually come together, they could really, really become a big problem for anybody that's trying to rule King's Landing. So piss the small folk off at your own risk. They notice Sea Smoke is acting really weird. Miseria says that he's probably lonely. Notice how Rhaenyra pauses for a second, like, wait a minute, does she know? Does she know what's up with Laenor? That he's still alive, hiding out in the east? Because it's Miseria we're talking about, like she traffics in information, like she is mistress of whispers, it's possible that she does know the truth about Laenor. But really what they're doing here is setting up the dragon seeds, which they mention later in the episode. Sea Smoke getting antsy, setting up the idea of his new rider surfacing. Rhaenyra then sends Reyna to the Vale with Joffrey and his dragon, Arax, promising Jane Aaron that she would get a dragon. We'll see her eventually in future episodes. There was a preview of her here. This is what she looks like on the show. She's actually a pretty big character during this part of the timeline. If you remember, Rhaenyra's mother is also from House Aaron, so they actually share a lot of blood. Even though Joffrey's Arax is very small now, he's still big enough for Joffrey to actually ride to be a threat to someone. So he's big enough for Rhaenyra to say, here's an actual dragon that you can see flying around, actually being a bit of a menace if he needs to be. Then she's sending Reyna with Aegon III and Viserys II and their dragons, Taraxes and Stormcloud, to Pentos, which will remind you of the original show with Daenerys Targaryen, who was living in Pentos with Illyrio at the time. We'll talk about her again in a second too, Daenerys Targaryen. But Reyna remembers that that's the place where she lived with her mother, Daemon's first wife, who died after Dracarising herself with Vagar rather than dying of complications from childbirth. Like she chose to end her life. But it's also a way to remind you that Vagar, now being ridden by Aemon, used to be ridden by her mother. When she mentions Prince Regio, that's the Prince of Pentos, we saw him during season one with Daemon and her mother. She basically asks Reyna to be a surrogate mother to them and raise them as much as need be while the Dance of the Dragons is going on. Like she's assuming that the Dance of the Dragons is going to last for a long time. In reality, it only lasted for a couple years. Reyna is mad, though, that she doesn't get to stay and fight because she currently, notice currently, does not have a dragon. That might eventually change. She does have the ability to bond with the dragon, though. Then we get Daemon arriving at Harrenhal. Damon's taking of Harrenhal is known as the fall of Harrenhal in the books. It marked the first actual engagement in the Dance of the Dragons as recorded by the Maesters, but it was largely a bloodless battle. As we saw on the show, it went down pretty easily without a real pitched battle. I've survived many a battle. I do not mean to be felled by poison peas. If you've not yet surmised, you are welcome here. Damon and Aemond had both been obsessed with Harrenhal because of its strategic point in the Riverlands and its historical value if you're talking about the history of Aegon the Conqueror, the Targaryen family. Just because of all the references back to the burning of Harrenhal by Aegon the Conqueror in Balerion the Black Dread. But in the actual conflict, like if you're actually talking about the war itself, it's an excellent staging point for either army, which is why they both wanted it so they could control the Riverlands. There are a couple of problems with this plan, though. Harrenhal is both important and also a big liability to whoever has to control it or does control it. Damon's whole plan has been to control the Riverlands to box the Greens in because they'd already secured the forces of the North, the Vale, they'd blockaded the entire Eastern Seaboard. But because Laris Strong is currently Lord of Harrenhal, Damon had to use Caraxes to take it by threat of force, mostly. Like, just the threat of an actual dragon was enough. Notice how he starts hearing weird things, seeing some visions. He sees the Great Hall, where the Great Council was just held years earlier by King Jaehaerys, who they mentioned several times in this episode. This banner in tatters is of House Strong. When he enters the hall here, we get our first look at Alice Rivers, the Witch of Harrenhal. I don't know that she's an actual witch practicing actual magic, or she just has a lot of clever skills. Damon makes a bunch of references to being poisoned, so it's possible that they mixed in some stuff with his food. Like, she could have put some stuff in his food. Not necessarily poison, but stuff to mess with his mind, like hallucinogens. During his conversation with Simon Strong, there's a lot of info, a lot of lore dumping too. This old chair carving on the back is of Heron Whore. Notice Simon Strong also hates Laris Strong, implies that he knows all about Laris, killing his father and brother. There's also a joke about him addressing Damon as prince and not king because he's married to Rhaenyra. He thinks of himself as king consort. Technically, you would call him your grace. Since your forebear incinerated much of it with his dragon. They mention Balerion the Black Dread, the burning of Harrenhal. He jokes about the history of the feud between House Blackwood and House Bracken when he talks about the decrepit state of the Riverlands just in general, like the state of the actual castle, Harrenhal. Like, even if we had the coin, it would take forever to fix this place. 
And basically the state of the Riverlands is in complete chaos, complete disarray, as much as the castle of Harrenhal itself is in chaos. Damon implies he means to kick them all into order or burn them alive with his dragon. And largely as we see, the castle is empty. There are people living there. It's just so massive that it seems empty by comparison. Couple of interesting details here too. The spire where Damon landed Caraxes is called the King's Spire Tower. It's the same spire where Aegon the Conqueror killed Heron Hor during the conquest with Balerion the Black Dread, which is why Damon landed there. Because he's such an old school Targaryen, like he arrives wearing his dragon scale armor with his Valerian sword, Dark Sister, wielded by Aegon's sister wife, no less. So you can see him flying up with Caraxes, thinking of himself just like the Conqueror. Like, I'm gonna do this just like Aegon did. But when he actually shows up, he seems like he's kind of bummed out, like there's nobody here, like there's no actual fight, like what's going on? So it's almost kind of comedic. But one of the big problems with Harrenhal, and this has been made fun of by many people across the history of Westeros, it's too big to actually garrison, like it's too expensive to just keep up. So it almost winds up being more of a liability to whoever does have to hold it. But it is still an important staging point in the Riverlands if you're talking about an actual war. So it's good and bad to have Harrenhal. The actual fall of Harrenhal, like this event Damon showing up and taking it, winds up being a huge deal for both the Greens and the Blacks eventually. Aegon was completely shocked and it winds up encouraging the Black side to win at the battle at the Burning Mill later. Back at the Red Keep, when Kristen Cole gets this little note from the runner here, my assumption is that he's getting word about the taking of Harrenhal. We see Alicent meeting with her brother, Gwen Hightower. He's meant to be a typical rich boarding school kid on the show. That's kind of the way they present him in this scene when he's looking down on Kristen Cole. Like, ah, you know, you seem like you've gone pretty far in your life. You made it to Hand of the King. Good for you, buddy. Clearly doesn't think that much of him. It looks like he kind of clocks that something is going on between Alicent and Kristen Cole too when she gives him her favor, even though she seems absolutely pissed at him. Like any love between them or any relationship that they might have had seems like it's genuinely over at this point. Wayne basically forces his way onto Kristen Cole's fighting force here. As they leave the city gates, we see Cheese's body still rotting, hang on the walls of the Red Keep here. There are a couple behind the scenes pictures the actors posted after episode, like after the blood and cheese deed went down. Everybody cheering for the dog, getting the last laugh. It seems like in real life, he was actually good friends with that dog when they were actually filming the scene. But because of the timeline of the episode, Rhaenyra and the Black Council start to worry about what's happened to Damon, having not received word from him about what he's done to take Harrenhal, fearing that they've lost him and Caraxes, and the dragons are like nuclear weapons, so having Caraxes and Damon was critical to their war effort. Thus, she gets the idea to seek out the dragon seeds, which is a huge deal from the books. Basically looking for anyone with enough Valyrian blood in their veins that are capable of riding one of the inactive dragons they have on Dragonstone. They currently have Vermithor, Silverwing, Sea Smoke, because remember laner has gone, but somebody else can bond with him, even though his rider is technically still alive. There's the three wild dragons, but I think they're only going to be doing Sheep Stealer on the show. We might see the Cannibal and Grey Ghost in a future season, though. And on the show, they've changed Bela's plot, so she's active on her dragon, Moondancer. She was not that active in the books. So if Rhaenyra can find riders for all those riderless dragons, they'll vastly outnumber the greens. And all the dragons, even the smaller ones, are really powerful. Currently, the greens only have Vagar, Sunfire, and Dreamfire, Helena's dragon. There's no way that she's going to be able to fly Dreamfire and fight in an actual battle. So technically, they really only have Vagar and Sunfire, two dragons. So you can see why it's so important for Rhaenyra to jump on the dragon seeds this early in the actual dance. They advise Rhaenyra to sequester herself to somewhere safer. That seems like more of a book reference. In the books, she's depicted as spending most of the dance recovering from her miscarriage that we saw during season one. The show has changed that to make her a much more active part of the plot, like her sneaking into King's Landing to meet with Allison. She's probably going to get more active in the actual fighting in later seasons. That's not in the books either. Notice how Rhaenys mentions King Jaehaerys talking about how he was able to rule peacefully for a much longer period than Aegon the Conqueror, like his actual rule was much longer than Aegon the Conqueror's because he was so good at making peace between people. It's meant to be more references setting up the end of the episode with the idea that Rhaenyra and Alicent working together might be able to find a more peaceful solution, but that's not the way they end the episode though. Don't worry, we'll get to that too because I was happy that they paid off some big Easter eggs from season one. Rainey's and Corley's whole conversation here at the shipyards, talking about making Reyna the heir to Driftmark instead of Joffrey, what they might do if Corlys himself were to die, I think is all meant to be set up for the reveal of the whole brothers in later episodes. 
That's also tied up with the dragon seeds too. Like they're really trying to get you to think about the dragon seeds now in the succession of Corliss's family. Like what's going to happen now with Driftmark after he's gone and after Rainey's is gone? That's why they're having all this talk about heirs and succession of Driftmark specifically here. Raina then leaves with the three boys and the three dragons. Taraxes is in the big box. The small box is Stormcloud. The other big thing here that most people will be talking about after this episode is Rhaenyra also sends Raina to Pentos with the four dragon eggs meant to be sort of a contingency plan if all goes to crap here in Westeros. Like you are the measure of last resort if nothing else works here and we all wind up dying in fire. A lot of people looked at this dragon eggs in the trailers and are like, wait a minute, are they trying to say that Daenerys' dragon eggs came from Cyrax? Because these eggs are meant to be from Cyrax's clutch of eggs. But there are four eggs here, and the colors aren't all right to be Daenerys' eggs. The actual lore on Daenerys' dragon eggs is that they were actually stolen from a clutch of Dreamfire's eggs much earlier in the timeline, like long before the events we're seeing on the show right now, and were taken to the far, far east because Illyrio bought them for Daenerys' as a wedding present way over in the far east from Ashai, where Melisandre is from. Then had those three sail back to Pentos. The other thing supporting the idea that Daenerys' dragons came from Dreamfire's clutch is that they look just like Dreamfire. Like, Daenerys' dragons look just like Dreamfire, as opposed to them looking like Cyrax. So we'll see what winds up happening with these four dragon eggs. They're currently destined to head to Pentos, but we'll see if that winds up happening. Like, there's still many episodes left this season. We haven't actually seen them in Pentos yet. We go back to the Red Keep. We get a scene with Helena talking to Allison about getting over her grief. She seems a little happier now. The reason why she's probably not quite as sad now is because she's seen the future in her dragon dreams, even though she can't tell dreams from reality sometimes and can't really place things in the time. Like she just sees random dreams of things and doesn't know what they are. I've actually been working on a larger video for this because she's seen Jon Snow, Daenerys in the future. She's seen the events of Robert's Rebellion. She's scribbled them all over her walls. So she's likely also seen the future of the Dance of the Dragons and recognized that her baby girl, Jahera, is going to be much more important to what winds up happening than her baby Jaehaerys was ever going to be. She also says that she forgives Alicent for getting it on with Kristen Cole, who seems very relieved, like, oh, thank God. We get another big lore dump where we actually find out that Aegon's new Valyrian steel armor is just Aegon the Conqueror's old Valyrian armor that he wore during the actual conquest. Lara Strong correctly does not want Aegon to go because he knows it's a terrible idea, like you would die instantly, like it'd just be an absolute disaster, but gets him to stay by lying to him, making him think that Aemond wants to usurp his throne with the help of Alicent, like, ah, oh, they're gonna take the throne from you while you're gone. Then he winds up rewarding Lara Strong, naming him officially as his Master of Whispers, even though technically he's been acting in that position for years at this point, but it's been more unofficial. They had that joke about Aegon's friends who are now Kingsguard not obeying the rules, particularly the vow of chastity. Another reminder about Kristen Cole getting it on with Alicent not obeying the rules. Also setting up later in the episode where they do the thing that Aegon said that they weren't going to do. Like, oh, this guy's going to get deflowered. Let's go get him some help. Then we get another Ulf White appearance in the tavern in Flea Bottom setting up the dragon seeds. They mention Dorne, the passing of his grandsire, quote unquote. He reveals that he's a Targaryen bastard and his grandsire is Jaehaerys I. He reveals that he's the half-son of Balon Targaryen, the bastard brother of Daemon and Viserys. In the books, they never really explain who his father was supposed to be, so this is like brand new lore that George R. R. Martin created for the show. The book only says that he's a Targaryen bastard. It never said who his father was. The blood of the dragon runs through these veins, and yes, a dragon seed must watch his own neck. This is also the first time the show has referenced the actual term dragon seed out loud. It's basically anybody who's capable of riding a dragon because they have enough Valyrian blood in their veins. He also sets up the idea that he's already a supporter of Rhaenyra over Aegon just as Aegon walks in. Oops. They wind up eventually going to the same brothel that Aemond has kept going back to since he lost his virginity there before the big time jump. Finding him in full Monty position, Aegon proceeds to humiliate him, even though he pretends like it doesn't bother him. Aemon seems pissed. Back on Dragonstone, we get a quick scene with Rhaenyra crying, thinking about sending her children away, holding one of their toys. In her box, she sees Allison's letter that she hasn't opened yet with the Green Hightower sigil on it, and it gives her an idea to meet with her in secret. We get a scene with Gwen Hightower almost getting their army killed or himself and Kristen Cole killed because he doesn't want to camp in the woods with everyone else because, like I said, he's a rich kid. She gets pretty close to it, like she was that close. 
but it also allows her to clock the fact that Kristen Cole, the Greens, have a force on the march, allowing her to report back to Rhaenyra in the Black Council, setting up next week's episode, the battle at Rook's Rest, essentially. Gwen Hightower kind of looked like he crapped his armor here, too. Notice when Lord Staunton mentions he's returning to Rook's Rest to rally his forces, almost all of next week's episode will be the battle at Rook's Rest, like it's meant to be almost an episode-long battle. There are a couple other battles before the battle at Rook's Rest, so I think we'll actually see all those at the beginning of the episode, and then like the rest of the episode will just be Rook's Rest. Back at Heron Hall, Damon starts to have all kinds of crazy visions, like the door's barred with a sword here. He starts seeing young Rhaenyra with a Millie Alcock cameo scene. A lot of people wondering if they'd ever bring the young versions of the actresses back. She's singing an old Valyrian song to dead baby Jaehaerys, sewing his head back on his body while Damon, saddened over his death, seems very remorseful over what happened. Like, I think the fact that he's crying here means that he is sad about what happened. When he finally comes back to his senses, he noticed that he's in the godswood under the weirwood tree with Alice Rivers, telling him that he's going to die here. And she is actually here. Like, this is not meant to be a vision. She's basically just telling him to screw off. Like I said, I think the hallucinations are mostly just a combination of his own mind, like the grief just kind of tearing him up inside. Maybe she slipped something weird into his food too. When we go back to Dragonstone, Mysteria seems like she's in the middle of talking with Alinda Massey, Rhaenyra's handmaiden here. Not sure what she's telling her about. Maybe it has something to do with the dragon seeds setting up future episodes because we will get more of the dragon seeds soon. Miseria then helps Rhaenyra sneak into King's Landing. I love the whole joke here too. Like she basically tells Rhaenyra that as long as you're not hot or you don't look like a rich person or people don't see your white Targaryen hair, you basically be invisible. Like nobody would look at you twice. And she basically walks into the city gates at King's Landing in broad daylight. She's disguised as a Septa. I'm sure there's a shame nun joke in here somewhere too. Her whole meeting with Alicent here in the Sept is meant to echo their scenes here during season one, which she also references like the last time we were in here talking to each other, we were getting ready for this giant battle that we were going to watch talking about the tournament in episode one. And basically like the big payoff here from season one, like the big thing they pay off is Alicent telling Rhaenyra what she heard Viserys say on his actual deathbed. And you think this would clear everything up over Aegon's prophecy of a song of ice and fire. Like, oh, he was talking about Aegon the Conqueror, not about Aegon the Second. Well, we got to stop this war right now. Rewatching the scene a couple times, it looks clear that Allison, on her face, understands that Rhaenyra is correct and Viserys was not talking about Aegon II, so Allison knows the truth, understands the truth now, but what she's telling Rhaenyra is that it doesn't matter. All because, like I said earlier in the video, the small council, particularly Aegon, Kristen Cole, Aemon, do not want to listen to anything she has to say. So even if she were to tell the truth about the mistake that they made, when she says there is no mistake, what she really means is it doesn't matter because they won't listen to me. Like the fact that she does know the truth doesn't matter. But it does seem like she is saddened by this. Like she does want to stop the fighting, but she feels like she can't. I think the showrunner has actually talked about this in the past where he said that ultimately they want to show that no matter what was going to go down, they were always going to come to this war. Like it was always going to happen this way no matter what. If there's any other Easter eggs or references that you spotted in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My episode 4 trailer video will post next and my full episode 4 video will post next week after they release it. So be sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss that. Everybody click here for that episode 4 video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that and click here for all my other House of the Dragon episodes. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.